Trevor Brown. I'm the director of the John Glenn School of Public Affairs, and I'd like to welcome you here to Page Hall. Uh, uh, it's nice to see so many of you here in these uh, now very intimate quarters. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment for us to pack this many people into the room. Uh, if you have to get up in the middle of this, you can't. <laughs> you, are, you are trapped here for the next hour. Hopefully, uh, my good friend and colleague, Rudy Hightower, and I are going to make this an interesting hour for you. Uh, and what we'd like to do over the course of the next 60 minutes or so uh, is first give you um, some perhaps deeper understanding of events in Ukraine and uh, Crimea. In a minute you'll learn a little bit about who we are and why we, we perhaps have some, some insight into things. And obviously Ukraine, Crimea, Russia uh, have been at the center of the news for the last several weeks, several months. Uh, and some of that coverage is um, accurate. Some of it glosses over a lot of important things that we think are important uh, to share. Uh, so part one of this will be to give you some insight into trying to understand what's going on in Ukraine beyond the, the headlines that you read every day. The second thing is, is to, to begin to talk about things that we in the United States the United States government can hopefully do moving forward uh, to keep Ukraine an autonomous, independent country with its borders intact. Uh, we'll talk about what some of the limits are uh, on what we can do as a nation, uh, but share with you some of our thoughts as to the pathways that we might pursue moving forward. Uh, and then the third thing we'd love to do, time permitting, and we hope that there will be, is to open it up to you. Um, to have you ask any questions of us uh, that you, you'd like, and uh, hopefully there'll be plenty of time to engage in more of uh, more the discussion. Um, with that, uh, the reason I have uh, some, some knowledge and interest in this region, uh, for almost 20 years, I worked on a project funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development that was directed by the former director uh, of the Glenn School by the name of Dr. Charles Wise. Uh, and this was a project that in the very early days of Ukraine's independence was set up to provide technical assistance to Ukraine's national parliament. Uh, so we have had an office in Kiev since 1994, uh, and sort of strangely, it closed up shop for reasons totally independent of events in Ukraine this July. Uh, so for the last 20 years, we've been involved working with uh, Ukraine's parliament trying to uh, assist in the process of establishing democratic practices in that parliament. Uh, some five, seven years ago, we commenced work in Crimea as well. Uh, if you may or may not be aware, Crimea up until several days ago was an autonomous region of Ukraine, uh, with its own legislative body, uh, its own government, all uh, a part of Ukraine's national uh, architecture of governance, uh, but had its own autonomous uh, government, uh, and we provided similar services to their parliament as well. So we've had an office in Sivaropol for about seven years, too. So for the last 20 years, I've been flying back and forth, spending extended periods of time uh, in Ukraine trying to promote democratic practices there. Uh, and so I have some, some knowledge of, uh, of, of what's going on there and, and an understanding of, of some of the dynamics, perhaps not in the great existential tilt between Russia and the United States, some truth in advertising, I'm not a foreign policy expert uh, on the sort of strategic interplay between uh, the two titans here, but do have a working knowledge intimate of some of the players in Ukraine and in Crimea and, and some of the institutional arrangements that are there. We'll share those with you as we get later to the talk. Um, but I'm going to turn the floor over here for a little while to my, my friend and colleague Rudy Hightower, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit about his own experience, but uh, because he, he has worked there in a different capacity uh, for many years. And, introduce you to that. I will just say briefly that he is a former Navy veteran uh, who was an intelligence analyst who used to run spy satellites over this part of the world, uh, so has a very different kind of, of understanding, uh, and is now a doctoral student here at the Glenn School, and his research 
centers on security issues in the Black Sea region, which encompasses Ukraine, uh, and is interested in um, sort of broadly the kinds of government programs uh, that we can put together that combine uh, military, diplomatic, economic assets to try and promote stability and democracy uh, abroad. Uh, and one of the benefits of the tandem that we have, uh, and we teach a class together called Rebuilding Failed and Weak States, is my experience over two decades has been in the development side of this, working for uh, the State Department ostensibly through the U.S. Agency for International Development. Rudy, his experience has been through the Department of Defense. Uh, and in years past, we kept those two things kosher. Uh, the military came in, uh, secured the ground, and then they left. The development folks parachuted in and tried to, to build um, economic growth, uh, social fabric, etc. In the wake of Iraq and Afghanistan, the world is different, and these two worlds are intertwined. So development actors now work very closely hand in hand with military personnel. Uh, and so we reflect that, that interchange, and in the classroom, it, it leads to a wonderful experience, and hopefully you see some of that here today. So I'm going to turn it over to Rudy, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his experience in Ukraine, and begin to give you some insights into what's going on there. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Rudy Hightower. I'm a retired naval intelligence officer. I was in the Navy for about 22 years. About 22 was just about enough. I just actually got out and wanted to study a different region. I actually focused more on Asia, and then I kind of turned my sights after retirement towards the Black Sea and the Balkans. Uh, pretty much I have a pretty crazy hobby. I just like to sit down with a drink of choice and stare at maps. So you'll see a lot of maps here today. Um, I can't do any talking pretty much about either maps or the whiteboard. But I just like to stare at maps and look at it and see what does it make sense, whether it be a border or an ethnic cleavage area or a population migration. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe I should get a more active hobby, but that's the one I have now. That kind of, that kind of brought me to uh, my interest in the Black Sea and Ukraine specifically, and then also uh, uh, tangentially the, uh, the Balkans. But uh, we'll, I'll start with a map just to kind of give us all a, a map orientation. And of course, you know, you've seen that in the news. All of this is Ukraine. Right? And down here, this is the Crimean Peninsula. But what a lot of people you know, don't know, and sometimes the maps on the, in the media don't actually show, is that there's a little strait right here in Kerch. That's Russia, right? and this strait is, you know, there's plans to build a bridge over this strait. That's how, how uh, small it is, how short it is. And it's always been a cultural and historic link between Russia and the peoples that have lived in Crimea, whether it be Ukrainians, Crimean Tartars, Russians, Greeks, and uh, other civilizations throughout history. But what we actually study here is not only the Black Sea, which extends down here and, and includes Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, Georgia, and then back up to Russia, back to Ukraine. But we also study some of the conflict areas. And uh, in studies, looking at maps and studying these conflict areas, there were four frozen conflicts. That's the, the actual term for them. One of them being Crimea, but also there's a sliver of land right along the Ukraine-Moldova border that also has some of the same dynamics as Crimea. And we're also looking at that as maybe being the, the next place that uh, Russian aggression uh, advances. There's also two other conflict areas over there in the Caucasus uh, we won't talk about today, but they have some of those, also those same dynamics. But moving along with the current crisis in Ukraine, we wanted to present some of the unique experiences that both Dr. Trevor Brown and I had in being in Ukraine. Uh, we both have spent a lot of time in the country, boots on ground. Uh, we've been taking the overnight train from Kiev down to Central uh, We've actually visited uh, Sevastopol, the headquarters of the Black Sea Fleet. And I'll show you some of those pictures. First off, we'll go to actually observing democratization in Ukraine. Uh, one of the most important things nowadays when you're, you take any kind of trip is to take some selfies. So I'm uh, just kind of giving you a quick lesson on how to take a selfie. And they said, okay, well, make sure that OSU is represented. <laughs> <laughs> represent me, Ohio State University. Okay? And this is the actual Maidan, or the main square in downtown Kiev where the, the Euro Maidan protests were actually occurring. And this is some of their main uh, monuments right downtown, which is a, a key concern in any selfie with some kind of recognizable uh, monument in the background. <coughs> and notice how high up I am, and I'm looking down, because I actually uh, checked into the Hotel Ukraine, which is right downtown, uh, overlooking the square, and uh, being the knucklehead that I am, I didn't listen to the gal at the front desk, 
who said, no, you don't want to get a room facing my dog because it's just so noisy, it's 24 hour music and everything else. And I was like, no, 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 I want to see the action, right? So put me as high up as you can, facing the, the actual protest area, right? Instead of the other side of the hotel. So I was on the 10th floor of Hotel Ukraine, facing the actual uh, Euromaidan uh, protest. And this was during, you know, this peaceful period between 9 and 28 December. And I have to say that the, the guy at the front desk was absolutely right because it was crazy noisy. I didn't get any sleep, but that's okay because it was so engaging and, and fascinating. But it was 24 hours singing, uh, political speeches, uh, religious um, sermons, day and night, just all the time. And it was very, very loud. And the actual stage was like right there. There were no buildings or hills between those massive speakers in my 10th floor room. So it was just an incredible experience, crazy loud. And uh, when I was actually walking around amongst the protesters, they had established this wall that I thought was incredibly interesting. And these were little blocks of, say, like two inch by 10 inch blocks of wood where people from cities all over Ukraine, all over the world, would sign the name of their city in this, one of these little blocks. And then they would build this little wall, of, this great wall there, right? When I first got there, this wall extended about a half a city block. But just two days later, the, the, um, the wall went down one city block, turned, and then went up the other city block. And it just so happened that I noticed that there was one of the city blocks, Columbus, Ohio. And in some amazing coincidence, whoever wrote that has the exact same handwriting as I did. <laughs> and then uh, also walking around, this is one of the main uh, monuments and, and cultural events in Ukraine. This was all during the Christmas season, which, which extends all the way to, to uh, the Orthodox Christmas there. January 7th, but this is normally, this, this tall structure is normally an absolutely beautiful Christmas tree. It's a wonderfully decorated Christmas tree. It's, it's, it's Krishatik. It's just a wonderful place to spend Christmas where you see families and, and court jesters playing music. Just a wonderful celebratory uh, event. However, during Euromaidan, this, this actual tree was taken up with political statements, maps, big nationalistic, prideful, pride in, in Ukraine uh, type messages. And this picture here was, at this time she was still in prison, just with her former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, who was looked at as being one of the uh, primary, um, uh, not martyrs, but one of the, the, the primary leaders and, and heroic figures of the protests. She uh, had since been released and is now currently uh, doing the circuit in Europe, uh, meeting with European leaders, meeting with opposition, not opposition, but uh, leaders in Ukraine to see what they want to do next in their actual government. One of the most important issues during the actual Euromaidan uh, protest was that the opposition protesters had taken over City Hall. They had taken over certain buildings. This would be in the main Kiev City Hall, the actual administration building. They would actually let people go in, because if you actually blocked anyone from going in, then that's the reason for the government to, to clamp down and, and actually come in with the, uh, the bulldozers and, and stop the protest. So people were able to go in and out, although there was a fair amount of influence and intimidation. But they also had 24-7 uh, video screens going with singing, uh, dancing, Ukrainian cultural things. It was a very, very festive, uh, nationalist, nationalistic uh, uh, environment. It, it was more like um, if you combine, say, the March on Washington with Woodstock. So it's both like you know, music celebrations, but also really important social dynamic and a social change uh, thing that was going on there. And at the beginning of the protest, they were mainly protesting because their president, Viktor Yanukovych, turned away from integration with Europe. But about two weeks into the protest, it, that all changed, and everyone that I talked to pretty much used the same line, and they would say that they just want to have a normal life. Because they would see what, with the rest of the world, how they live, and they just wanted to have a normal life, free of the corruption and some of the, uh, the governmental issues that they actually had uh, throughout the country. So the impetus of the protest went from we didn't sign up for the European agreement like we thought we should have, to we just want to change our government, to reform our government and make massive change for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. So it's very, very interesting to see that dynamic change and the actual uh, reasons why they were protesting. <coughs> These are the, uh, the barricades. These are some of those uh, famous barricades that you heard about in the news. 
Um, they were about nine, ten feet tall. You know, and this was very, very cold then. So uh, it was a lot of ice and snow. There was also like park benches, uh, old tires, doors, everything just thrown into these, these barricades. And uh, no one could get through these barricades. All the, the foot traffic was allowed to pass through. One little area you could actually drive a car, uh, but there was no way that the big government uh, bulldozers or things could actually get through these barricades that were on the main street. But also what was very impressive, that the protesters blocked off the side streets, the feeder streets, so that there couldn't be any, uh, any rush into the, uh, the protest area. So they were pretty much hunkered in for the long haul. And, uh, and it was, like I said, it was just such an incredible uh, demonstration of democracy. They, were, they wanted to change their government. They wanted to have better voting rights. They wanted to have uh, better effective government. Uh, they wanted more delivery of public services. They, all, all the things that we generally take for granted. And of course, I had to have another selfie, right, just to make sure uh, that we actually place, place ourselves there. Uh, interesting also to note was, when I was first here, I was walking around, I pretty much had a big black jacket on, and I had a little scarf, and I had a black beanie cap pulled down. And I get, uh, of course, I didn't blend in, because I got a chocolate face and dreadlocks. So, so I was like, okay, let me just see what I can see by, by moving around. Uh, but then, more and more, I thought, well, you know what, let me let these folks know where I'm really from. So I, I got, took off my, my big beanie, and I had OSU, I had my uh, OSU bandana, so that they would know, hey, wait a minute, this guy's not from here, right? And of course, they could see they just didn't face anything else. Uh, and it was amazing once I did that, because then people would come up to me and shake my hand and, and say, well, you know, thanks for being here, thanks for being here. First, I was thinking, well, maybe there's a security issue, I gotta be a little careful. But it wasn't that at all, at least among the protesters. I did have a little concern about the government troops. I only had one little incident there, but I had a slick talking taxi driver and got me through one of the, the government uh, uh, barricades. But it was amazing that how people would just come up to me and shake my hand because they wanted the world to see exactly what was going on. Right? And then a little bit later, I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and really show them where I'm from. It took the bandana off, the dreads fly, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, this guy really is from here. And it was amazing, <laughs> even, even more people came up and, and shook my hand and really you know, complimented me for being there. And I'm like, hey, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm not taking sides, I'm just an independent researcher trying to find out what was going on. But it was really amazing just the, the feeling walking amongst these, these uh, protesters. And also, um, I got this little hat, I threw this in there because the, these hats became very symbolic of the protest. Because, you know, at first, the uh, Barracuda, or the, the, the riot police, stormed in, and of course they had all their, their riot gear on, and it became symbolic to the protesters to wear some kind of hat. So what they ended up wearing is they, they would wear uh, hard hats, bicycle helmets, bandanas, whatever, just symbolically that, okay, we have a hat on too, and we're gonna go up against the, the actual um, government forces. Uh, uh, when I walked past here, I was like, holy smokes, I might get one of those in the suit there. But the guy that was actually painting it said, uh, these are for the protesters. Uh, uh, that. But the gentleman that was actually, you know, kind of handing them out, wanted me to take a picture with one, so he threw on one of the hats, and we had, we had a selfie of that too. Uh, now, further uh, along, like late at night, uh, I was walking around like two in the morning, three in the morning, just to kind of see the difference between the activities during the day and, and night. And what was really also impressive is that these these old tents. Uh, were set up, there had to be hundreds of these old tents. The important thing about these tents is that every city was represented. So when you see the news that it's like, okay, well, Eastern Europe, Ukraine wants to separate, or Southern Ukraine wants to separate, the entire country during this Euro Maidan was represented in these protests. That's actually a city of uh, Dnepropetrovsk, which is in the central eastern part. Uh, this is in Russian, that's Odessa, which is in the southern part of uh, Ukraine along the Black Sea. But every city had one of these, uh, one of these tents. This was the actual uh, large rally that I attended. And actually, here, that's Hotel Ukraine. So right there, that's my hotel room. So like I said, I got the best seats in the house. Right? So then when I actually uh, came and was walking amongst the, uh, the crowd, stood up on uh, one of those, those uh, big light poles that had the, the base, it had an elevated base. So I was like, okay, you know what, I sit standing up there, let me go ahead and get up there. Kind of hung on there, took some pictures there, and uh, once again took off the, the beanie cap so the OSU was represented in the second. The important thing to note was you'd see American flags in there, there are German flags. The actual speaker was a politician from Por uh, Portugal at that particular time. This protest or this rally had about 100,000 people, it was estimated. Uh, but some of the ones a little earlier went up to 200 or 300,000. 
There were tons of political writings uh, throughout the entire Maidan, Euro Maidan area. government at the time, and that led to the, led to the extreme violence that we saw in the news, and, and it uh, eventually led to uh, mass deaths there in, uh, in downtown Kiev. So it was clashing on the 18th of February, 18 people dead, but it was on that 20, 20th of February was that massive uh, killing of the protesters and police officers, which led to the, the downfall of the Yanukovych government. President Yanukovych disappeared. Uh, he was on the run. And then that transitioned to uh, Vladimir Putin doing what he did in Crimea. So we're going to shift a little now to this, specifically to the Crimean Peninsula. Just, once again, Navy guy, we got to have a map. So uh, here, this is the main road and railway that goes into Crimea, and, it, and all the roads lead to Simferopol, the capital of Crimea. Uh, you notice that in the, in the southeast, uh, southwest portion, it's Sevastopol. That was the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. This is a zoom in, so you see that this is Russia. So you see how, how small that uh, Kerch Strait is. Right? Uh, this is Feodosia, where some of the Ukrainian Marines held out the longest. Uh, in face of the uh, uh, Russian troops that were there. And I just inserted a picture of a Ukrainian-American girl in traditional costume whose maternal grandparents are actually from Theodosia. She also happens to be my four-year-old daughter, so of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there in Crimea, Crimea has been tagged, so whether it's Ukraine now or, or Russia now or Ukraine before, it has been tagged with OHIO. We actually, uh, Dr. Trevor Brown and I took a study abroad trip uh, to Ukraine. And we took 10 uh, OSU students and they spent a week in Kiev doing research, uh, seeing the historical and cultural uh, landmarks. And we took that overnight train down to Simferopol and spent a week uh, in Simferopol, uh, getting lectures from university professors, uh, seeing some of the cultural sites. And we went to the Labadia Palace, which is right along the, the, the coast outside of Yalta where the conference between the 1945 Yalta conference between Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill pretty much made, you know, find the lines of what post-World War II uh, Europe would look like. Okay. Should be redrawn today. Uh, as an excursion, I took uh, five of the students, uh, to, and I think it took us uh, an hour and a half, maybe two hour excursion from Simferopol to Sevastopol, uh, which was pretty incredible. This was actually the second time that I've been to <coughs> Sevastopol as a retired U.S. Navy intelligence officer, being able to just, you know, look at the, uh, the Black Sea Fleet up close and personal like that, it was pretty fascinating for me. Because what we, what we did is um, we just got on one of those uh, Johnny Depp Pirates of the Caribbean uh, tour boats to go out and do a little harbor tour. So we're out on this harbor tour going right past all the ships of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. So the students were taking their pictures with, you know, with their cameras and cell phones and, so uh, I popped up my Blackberry, which I had at the time, and uh, took some picture, uh, pictures, and I was like, wow, this is the easiest find I ever did in my life. <laughs> and it's crazy because all of these radar systems and missile systems, I know all about those things. We have names and ranges and all of those things, and I'm just going by. And some of the students would ask me about it, and I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I forget. I'm just an <laughs> academic now, I don't, I don't do the spy business. But this was one of the, the most significant, this is the Moscow, this A-10, one of the most significant warships in the Russian fleet. And the importance of Sevastopol to the Russian Black Sea Fleet is that that's Russia's only warm water port. Um, it's also important because it, it can control the entire Black Sea region because the only way you get into the Black Sea is through a very small strait of the Bosphorus, which is right outside of uh, Istanbul. And Turkey controls that strait, and there's a 1936 convention that limits the tonnage of ships that can go into the Black Sea. So we can't roll in there with a uh, carrier battle group or some of the major ships that we have in the U.S. Navy. So any ships that are actually within the Black Sea, they can build up whatever size navy they wanted. So pretty much the Russian Black Sea fleet built up a, a fleet that is can dominate all the other countries within the Black Sea. And uh, you know, more recently, uh, these were the uh, some pictures of the actual unidentified mass gunmen uh, who in, in any term uh, equal, equals mercenary or terrorist. Uh, 
those are the ones that, that pretty much didn't come into Crimea, but just left the barracks and the bases that they were already at. Uh, the, the media often portrays it as an invasion. However, most of the initial troops were already in Crimea. And that's a very important point to note uh, from a geopolitical standpoint of the dangers of having foreign troops on your, your land at a higher level than your own troops. And uh, this is the Ukrainian brigade pretty much giving up their, their uh, air base and moving out peacefully. And this gentleman here, uh, this colonel, is actually now a local Ukrainian hero. He's one of the ones that, that held out the longest and didn't give up his position, didn't give up his men or his weapons uh, until just recently where he was ordered by the uh, Ukrainian government in Kiev. And then, uh, of course, we know about that March 16th referendum that the, uh, the Crimea seat uh, voted to succeed and go to Russia. Important thing to note is that uh, when I was there and, and dealing with Crimeans and talking to them, uh, they pretty much weren't happy with the Ukrainian government, didn't really call themselves Ukrainians, but they didn't always call themselves Russians either. They called themselves Crimeans. So, uh, and, and it was surprising to me that they weren't really offered that option of just being an independent Crimea where they could play both sides of the fence and, and keep their relations with Russia, keep their relations with the West. But pretty much they, they you know, went uh, part and parcel uh, to Russia. Now you hear in the news uh, a lot of reasons why this all happened and you know, the annexation of Crimea. Uh, you get different points of view. Uh, there's a couple of different arguments. Uh, I'm going to go through four of the main arguments. Uh, the historic argument is uh, one that's pretty well promoted. It was even promoted here at the John Glenn School because it had to be three, three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, we actually hosted six members of the Russian parliament staff here just as, a, as one of those friendship tours through the uh, International Visitors Council. And, uh, and those uh, representatives, you know, we gave them a tour of the building. We uh, talked about the John Glenn School in Central Ohio. It was a, a very good presentation. It was very friendly. It got a little testy at the end because I wish the boss had to ask you know, the 800-pound uh, gorilla in the room question uh, to those people that are actually working for the Russian parliament. So it got a little testy, but, but then it you know, ended uh, pretty friendly. But one of their main arguments was that in 1954, Khrushchev gave away Crimea to the, Russian, uh, to the Ukrainians. Right? Uh, we didn't really push the issue too much, but I had to say something about history because history did not start in 1954. Uh, before 1954, 10 years before 1954, Stalin rounded up the Crimeans, took their, uh, the uh, Tartars, the Muslim population, which is descended from, uh, they are descended from Genghis Khan, <coughs> and pretty much rounded them up and they were forced exiled into uh, Central Asia. Right? Uh, and then also 10 years before that, there was uh, what's known as the Hall of Door. It was uh, Stalin's program of collectivization we pretty much you know, took all the farms and it's all for one, one for all. However, that led to mass starvation of Ukrainians. And during that same time, there was also mass input of Russian nationals into Crimea. Right? Uh, also, if you go back before that, it was pre-Soviet. It was the, the uh, Imperial Russian Empire. Before that, it was the Ottoman Empire, and then the Tartars, the Scythians, the Cimmerians, the Genoans, uh, the, the Italian um, explorers from back in the day, uh, and it all it just goes back throughout history. So this part of the world was owned by a lot of people a lot of different times. Right? This is actually, you know, if you look at the Black Sea, it's, it's the area of Jason and the Argonauts and all of that. So, so historically, uh, these areas have, have uh, changed ownership over and over and over. Right? So the historic argument, just like Russia, you know, we don't think it's getting back to Alaska. We don't think France is getting back to uh, Louisiana or get back. So using the, the historic argument, we don't think that that is a valid argument. The threats to the ethnic, ethnic Russians, uh, although there, there were no reported acts of violence against ethnic Russians in Crimea, uh, although that was used uh, by the Russians as one of the justifications for the annexation. And while I was there, um, I never noticed any, any problems whatsoever. And I really, like I said, I really stand out there. And I had no issues. Uh, and ethnic Russians or anyone there in Crimea had free access and free travel in and out of the area. Uh, I've seen the trains that went from Simferopol to Moscow. I've seen the trains that went from Fyodosin to Moscow. 
and during the tourist season, those trains would be filled. Right? So it was unrestricted travel. You could be free to go back and forth, back and forth. There was no uh, <coughs> impediments to travel. There was no impediments or, or, or really overt uh, violent acts towards ethnic uh, Russians in Crimea. Also, as part of that, that argument, OSCE monitoring, or the, the Organization for Security and, and Cooperation in Europe, offered to monitor Crimea to make sure that there was no violence. Uh, so we think that that argument is, again, is uh, as the film holds. Threats to the Russian Black Sea Fleet. I told you what the, the importance of the Russian Black Sea Fleet was, that it's uh, the only uh, more and more report from Russia. Uh, so it's logical to assume that that new Ukrainian government, especially after that new Ukrainian government, one of the first things they did once, once they assumed power was to limit uh, the use of the Russian language. And that freaked out a lot of people that, did, uh, that pretty much scared the, the, the Russians into thinking that it's more than likely that that same government would cancel the lease on the Russian Black Sea Fleet. So that's a logical argument. And maybe the, this is just editorializing, but, but um, maybe the most important reason why uh, President Putin and Russians uh, annexed Crimea was because of the, the uh, it's, it's often been argued that Ukraine lost Crimea just as much, maybe more, than Russia took because of the mismanagement over the last 20 years of that autonomous region. Um, the language issue was always a, a key concern. But also the, the influence of political theory written by Machiavelli in the 1500s uh, in the book The Prince, where if you're in power, if you can take land, take land. And it's also been argued that, that one of the things that Putin may be trying to do or wants to do is to achieve true czar status. Not just be, okay, a president for a certain amount of time, but to be at a czar status at the level of, say, Peter the Great or Ivan the Terrible for the future history books really be looked at as uh, one of the quintessential leaders of, of the Russian people. And to do that, to be a true czar status, personally, I think you have to do two things. You have to either capture land for the empire or not give up land for the empire. And in annexing Crimea, uh, Putin was able to capture land. That's where there's a euphoric uh, feeling of patriotism uh, throughout uh, Russia. And we don't anticipate uh, that the Western Ukraine will, will get Crimea back. Also, the, the Russians probably calculated that neither the Ukraine or the West would respond militarily, and that these visa and economic sanctions would be worth the pain and suffering uh, for bringing back Crimea. Because Crimea is like the French Riviera for the Russians and the Eastern Europeans and the uh, Belarusians and Ukrainians. It's beautiful, wonderful land, rolling hills, vineyards, and, and all of that. So it's a, it's a true gem in the Black Sea, and it's very, very important to all of the countries in that region. So I think that that argument, just because they could take it, they took it. That would be valid. And then the big question is, uh, will Putin invade Eastern Ukraine? And with that, uh, I'll turn back over to Trevor, and if you have any questions about uh, what I presented or in general, or what you've read in the media, please feel free to yeah, before we get to questions, just as I promised at the very beginning, and I will keep this brief because I want to make sure that we have time for you all to ask us any questions. There, uh, the, the big question beyond will Putin invade Eastern Ukraine is, well, what can we do about it? Uh, and the reality is very little. Um, if you look at the makeup of our military <coughs> presence in, in Europe, it is vastly diminished from what it was uh, 10, 20, 20 years ago, particularly uh, the drawdown really began with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so consequently, in light of uh, connection with Rudy's argument about why did Putin do this, well, he could. He could in part because we're not there anymore to the degree that we used to be there. And so the military option really is off the table in a fundamental way for the United States. There are some strategic things that we could do, and should we have time Rudy can talk to you given his, uh, his security experience about um, softer military actions that we could take to demonstrate uh, that we're, we're still a presence in the region. But fundamentally, uh, we do not have the kind of true presence or tactical presence that we used to that might have been a sufficient deterrent. So that's sort of, that option is not a strong one. 
The second is a lot was made in the last couple of weeks about our ability to impose sanctions. Uh, and those sanctions could be meaningful to, to the Russians. Uh, the Russians are now wholly integrated into the world economy. Uh, the big difference between now and say uh, the end of the Cold War period is that they are no longer a closed economic system onto themselves, but are rather uh, connected to lots of uh, economic entities, whether they be small firms or major banks or, or international agreements. Uh, so there is a basis on which uh, the market and sanctions could hurt them. One of the things that you perhaps noticed in the news at the dawn of this was that the ruble uh, went, went south fast and um, a number of uh, trading firms wanted to get out of, uh, of Russia. There was a, an initial fire sale on the stocks on the Russian stock exchange, suggesting some power to the argument that we could impose some pain on Russia through uh, economic sanctions. Uh, and again, the truth is, we could. The other side of that story is, it can hurt us. Uh, and us, I, I expand not just to the United States, but largely to our principal uh, allies in, in Western Europe. Uh, we'll follow in the news uh, a big, uh, Obama was in Brussels uh, making uh, statements about our commitment to our European alliance, particularly NATO and so forth. Uh, and part of that is to draw up support, support among our European allies for imposing economic sanctions on, uh, on Russia and concomitantly weathering the economic <coughs> sanctions that they might be able to impact on us. Many of those economies are very, very dependent on Russia's primary export, which is fuel. Uh, so there are things that Russia could do to, uh, to firms in Germany, Poland, and, and all sorts of other countries uh, throughout uh, Western Europe that make the prospect of sanctions uh, a painful one on both sides. And Putin, in his recent statements, has been very open uh, about the interdependency that now exists between Russia and the West. He's wholly cognizant that at the same time we could impose pain on him uh, and the Russian economy, the Russians could impose pain on, on the US. So while there is some hay being made about the prospect of sanctions, the real key to those will be, will we be able to recruit allies in Western Europe uh, to commit to, to those and suffer the, the pain that, that comes with them? Over the longer term, what that will mean is, at the moment, the primary uh, pathway for Russia into Europe is through its, its uh, fuel pipelines. Uh, many of these economies are very dependent on Russian oil. Uh, and the opportunity that exists, not tomorrow, but over the, the, the midterm, is are we, as a nation, able to help alleviate Europe's dependence on that Russian fuel? Uh, we will, at some point in the not too distant future, become an exporter of natural gas uh, at a much higher volume than uh, we have been in the past with the uh, <coughs> all of the, the fines in shale oil gas. So that raises some big questions domestically for us about how quickly we want to go down the pathway of increasing our ability to extract oil, or sorry, fuel from, from shale oil uh, deposits and then export that uh, because that could become a strategic imperative to wean Europe from, uh, from Russia. Another opportunity that is perhaps our, our best shot, in my personal opinion, is uh, to make Ukraine a viable, democratic, stable economy and country. Uh, that has been the goal in the United States for the last 20 years. Uh, and we have been uh, a big supporter, we the United States, of uh, stability, economic growth in Ukraine. Uh, in recent years, with the United States pivot to Asia uh, and concerns about terrorism in the Middle East, uh, we have redirected resources away from this region. There's not the same investment that there was, say, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, and so we have neglected this part of the world for um, some, some part of the last decade. 
But a lot of the infrastructure that we laid in the 1990s in the way of development organizations, so Rudy and I are examples of connections that exist here in the United States that uh, have gone somewhat dormant, but that could be expanded uh, in relatively short order. And one of the things you'll see, you may have noticed in the news, uh, the United States spends through the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, a little south of $100 million uh, annually. Um, Congress has approved authorization of an additional $50 million. Uh, to try and expand programs in Ukraine to promote democracy and economic stability. And the reason that becomes important for Ukraine's future is, sadly, what this will become, and uh, Rudy was suggesting earlier, as you, as you look beyond Crimea, and you look to some of these eastern uh, provinces, oblasts, regions, the debate is going to be about, you have to pick sides. You, you as Ukrainians are going to have to choose between Russia and the West. I think that's a sad choice because the history of Ukraine, as, as Rudy's um, uh, family life demonstrates, and, and lots of the examples he gave here, is that this is where East and West mix. Uh, and causing them to choose is going to cause them to, to perhaps accelerate uh, splitting apart. Uh, but the reality is, is that there is a choice that will be made uh, as people begin, and, and I think Rudy's comments earlier about when he walked around the Maidan and asked people, or came, the people came up uh, to him, what, what Ukrainians fundamentally want is they want a better life. And, and by better life, that means stable economic uh, situation, a government that they can have trust and faith in. Uh, and sadly, even those on the reform side Tymoshenko is a name that you will see as a, uh, as a potential presidential candidate uh, coming up. She's not necessarily well embraced by the average populace because uh, she's thought to be an elite uh, and as much, as much responsible for some of the graft and corruption as the person who just fled Ukraine in the form of Viktor Yanukovych. Uh, and so many Ukrainians look to uh, the current system of government with some degree of dissatisfaction. It is not, the, the democratic government experiment has not yet borne the fruit uh, that many people uh, had expected. Uh, and Ukraine, this is not, if you will recall back to 2004, 2005, Ukraine has gone through a similar exercise uh, in the uh, Orange Revolution that threw out previous uh, presidents, so to speak. So what needs to happen is the United States, and this is the tough part, uh, we know from our own experience here in the United States that the democratic experience, experiment goes on. Uh, it takes a long time. It takes multiple generations to build a commitment to democracy and to build the foundations of economic growth. Uh, and the United States has to commit to that long-term uh, endeavor. We've been there for 20 years. Uh, odds are good we will continue to provide support and resources. Uh, but in the balance between guns and butter, uh, here, the better, the better emphasis should, in my judgment, be on those development programs because our ability to operate on the defense side, and there will be calls for us to rattle sabers, um, are, are going to be less impactful on the, on the defense side than they would be on, on the development side. We have about 10 minutes before this breaks up, and so we'd love to open it up to any questions you have for, for either of us. and. Um, Got your hand Trevor, could you talk a little bit about where political cadre could come from? I mean, my understanding of Moshenko and the rest of the crowd is this is the consumable, yep. Soviet consumable who are now in power, and that's where the training comes from, how to be a bureaucrat, how to yep. motivate people, how to, so where, where could the cadres come from who could replace that layer of society who's found to be left? <coughs> A couple of places. A charismatic leader, like a Klitschko, although he doesn't have the experience of working class, but also from the business community. Uh, the oligarchs and the really super rich that have a lot of power economically, but also have the wherewithal and the desire to get into politics to try to make a difference. So I think that, that within the economic sphere, you can find a, a group of leaders or there's emerging a group of leaders that may be able to uh, 
have it show an option to those standard, it's just the same old corrupt folks uh, option for the training population. So I'll give you, um, when we teach our class, we, we look at a variety of different countries. and. Um, we started actually this semester looking at Ukraine, then we transitioned to Rwanda, and now we're looking at Iraq, and we happen to be talking about Rwanda, and one of the students said, this is easy, we can fix all the problems in Rwanda, we just need a Nelson Mandela to emerge. Like, if he would just show up, it would fix all the problems. Um, and in, in my judgment, that is the common knee-jerk response of most, particularly on the diplomatic side, is the where's the reformer, where's the champion? Um, and we, we in the West like to make bets on individuals. Of course, Yeltsin in Russia, it was going to be Leonid Kuchma here in Ukraine many years ago, and he turned out to be so, and then it was Yulia Tymoshenko. Um, I think we put too much faith in individuals that, because there was only one Nelson Mandela, um, and, and I think the likelihood of somebody like that emerging here is unlikely given the past. I think our better emphasis should be on institutions, processes, parties, building the infrastructure around those people so that they are, if there is a Nelson Mandela-like person, they can emerge and operate successfully, but also putting curbs on the ability of those people to engage in the abuses that they, they have uh, engaged in in the past. Because I think you're right, I think the inclination of many of the leaders that come out of this environment is to operate as they have in, in a more traditional Soviet bureaucratic context. Uh, and so our emphasis should be on building the, the infrastructure around those people so that when someone does emerge, they, they can succeed. I, I do some business over in Eastern Europe, so it concerns me, but I, I just gash an issue. What was Europe doing 10, 20 years ago before this became such a, a, an important part of their economic engine? Well, they were consuming less, um, right? I mean, so part of... Were they still getting the Russian gas at that time? <coughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I think they were, they were consuming uh, Russian gas. They had a more... But they had a more diversified uh, fuel portfolio uh, than they do now. I mean, Russia now has gas flows in some countries where 70% of their, their energy comes from, from Russia. Uh, and so... You know, they need to they need to diversify to alternative uh, well, sources. You know, so, what's your position on? You know, it seems like like Putin <coughs> takes over Ukraine, uh, okay, and so that strengthens him to some some degree. Well, what what's your position then on him continuing and picking off other countries as he sees fit? Uh, when you say my the position, I I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what could we do? That, but what's your reading? <laughs> the State Department, you can do business and do his product. Well, the first thing, and I'll let Rudy answer this, Crimea is di different than Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, and it's different in many important ways. The, the strategic value of Crimea to Putin is much greater uh, than, than Eastern Ukraine. So the, the demand there is in this grade. Um, the, there's no question that if, should he choose to, I think he could. Um, I think that the true strength that's there could roll across that border very, very quickly. Um, and I think there's, there's little we could do to stop it. Uh, now, what's the gain for him? I don't know. I think at this moment, he's one of one of the things that I think we gets kind of overreported in the news that, that Rudy mentioned here is this thought that um, Russia just decided one day to go ahead and do this, just flip the switch, and they were going to take it. Russia was so firmly embedded into Crimea already that, in some ways, this was kind of a titular change, um, and it's the same is somewhat true throughout eastern Ukraine. Russian banks. Um, the, are so intertwined into funding many Europe, uh, industries throughout the eastern portion of Ukraine that he can exercise de facto control over that region without having to roll, roll troops in. Similarly, the way that the economic system was set up in the Soviet Union, um, those firms are almost beholden to, to Russian. Uh, they are the inputs into larger manufacturing plants in Russia. So if they want to sell their products, they got to sell them to Russia. So I think, you know, I, I can't see into the mind of Putin. I, I can't claim to do, to do that exercise. Uh, but I think there's less, there's less likelihood that that's, that's going to occur. Uh, unless we start rattling the saber. So if we were to say, uh, let's, expand, let's expand NATO, uh, let's, let's 
move Poland, all of these countries into the NATO alliance and begin to, to try and build up troop strength again, I think that might poke the bear and, and cause him to do those things. But that's my opinion. I mean, you, you may have other uh, views on, on that. I, I think it's a risk-reward trade -off. It's all about the calculus between the risk and the reward. Well, money at the end of the day. Right, money at the end of the day and, and lies, but there's, there's a little bit more than money, really. There's, there's the feeling of great Russian patriotism and a historic connection to their culture, history, and all of those things. It can't be denied, especially in that Eastern, uh, the portion of uh, Eastern Europe. But I think more is risk reward. Crimea represented relatively low risk compared to the reward of recapturing all that land. The risk, the rewards of getting Eastern Europe, I mean Eastern Ukraine, would be much greater, but the risk is much greater. And to try to threaten any of the other countries, especially the Baltics or Poland or anyone that's a NATO ally, that, that risk is just far above the reward that Putin would consider. That's just a, you know, a calculation that I don't think they're making right now. Take any other country other than see what they can do in Eastern Eastern Ukraine you know, the only one that maybe try to get, other than small breakaway regions, like a region right along the border of Ukraine. Well, how do they hop if they, if they're, you know, the Kermar, or, or if they hop over to Moldova, how do you, you know, it doesn't make sense, they got to go all the way through Ukraine. Let me show you a map. The Russians here wouldn't have to really travel up there, because just like in Crimea, there's already Russian peacekeepers in that area. There was actually a shooting war in the early 90s between that breakaway region and Moldova. So the ones keeping the peace there now are Russian troops. There's tanks there. So it's not a matter of we wouldn't have to bring tanks in to stir up unrest there. And what you see in the news now, some of the same dynamics that those people were saying, well, we want to have a referendum. We want to join Russia. And even, even now, and that's kind of to be seen how far that's going to be. Let's pivot to this set, so maybe we're here in I, when they talked about you know, Crimea wanting to go with Russia, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the financial implications of that on, on the Russian economy. And would they be able to sustain that? And would, would that also slow any other further you know, invasion into the eastern Ukraine? Just from an economic standpoint, can they afford uh, the that's, cost my, of that's my bet. That, that's where I think our best bet is that let them shoulder the responsibility. As Russia expands, it, it it gains territory, but it also gains burdens. And and Crimea is is very different than Ukraine in many respects. Partly because even though Ukraine's economy is not vastly developed. Crimea's is way behind in terms of its basic infrastructure, its ability to access um, water, electricity, and so forth. And the demands there are high. Citizens are now expecting, you know, so part of the initial thrill of, yeah, we're going to join Mother Russia is that patriotic feel. But underlying that is, my life will be better off because. Russia's going to come in and provide services. It's going to take care of the roads. It's going to make sure that employment improves and all that. And that's going to be a heavy task. Um, and, and I think over the long run, Russia's going to find that it will struggle economically, uh, especially as other fuel sources come online. And its overall economy is really, really dependent on fuel exports. Is it going to have the ability to, to pay for its new new responsibilities. That's my bet. Um, but there are others who think um, that Russia will be able to withstand uh, the economic decline that may come as a result of this in, in, a, in a way that we might not. Our, our tolerance for decline may be a lot less than their tolerance for, for decline. Just a comment, maybe, to Rudy. I, I'm not sure of Crimea as far as where their their money comes from, but is it a lot of it from tourists? The overwhelming majority is tourism. There's some agriculture, but mostly tourism. Uh, the cities there, uh, the one Theodosia, uh, for example, is 100,000 people. Uh, I know this because I was there, and, and uh, being told that out of this 100,000 people, there's three black people. 
like, what? Well, three? That they, that, I was like, how do you know it's three? And like, well, there's two other guys and you just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. And the funny thing is I saw one of the other guys. I was like, oh, so it's like, like, I was like, hey, buddy. You know? but, but it's like 100,000 people in Theodosia. But during the summer, it skyrockets up to over a half a million people. And it's absolutely wonderful there during the, uh, during the tourist season. And right next to Fiodosi is a place called Cocktail where they have the Cocktail Jazz Festival, and it's uh, just you know a wonderful vacation kind of area. So tourism throughout that whole area is their is their main bread and butter. <coughs> and that and now okay with, with Russian troops in there and armed mass gunmen, that's not that doesn't tourist season's <laughs> over. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tourism. Nobody's summering there. I just wanted to say, can we talk a little bit about provocation and what you mean by that? from the little cream and, uh, because something I've noticed in a lot of the coverage about Crimea in English language coverage is that the referendum has not been problematized. People are not really digging deeply into understanding how this referendum came about and what the results mean or what they actually represent or they don't represent and um, how much of a falsification this, this whole thing really was. Can you talk about maybe not so much the need for tanks to come into eastern Ukraine if um, there's the hope or the reliance on sort of meddling and playing with the local politics. So, what was it, 93% voted in, in favor? Well, well, that's pretty good. I've seen numbers up to 96% voted for succession. However, that's very misleading because if you have 96 or even 93%, you have to ask yourself, do they have babies in this area? How can you have 96% of the residents? And that's where some of the reporting, the Western media reporting, is just throwing out that number, where it's like, wait a minute, it's maybe 96% of those that participated in the vote, and of those that participated in the vote, what percent does that represent the population of the two million Ukrainians? So it may, may have been 40% of the, the actual population. So, so the numbers and the statistics get skewed when you look at what really happened out of that referendum. And However, it was overwhelming that the Crimeans that did vote want to be called Russians. But, but your point, I mean, the whole process was engineered and rigged. And then first, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there, there are democratic institutions and practices within Crimea, flawed in many respects. Uh, but the sitting prime minister was ousted and then very quickly a, um, a new prime minister was put in who represented a very small fringe party, less than 3% of the last, uh, his party represented 3% of the electorate or, or the vote share in the previous election. He was installed as prime minister. He's the one that then engineered the, the, the referendum very quickly. Um, and you're right, there was very little coverage of that and very little discussion of it. The reporting I've seen, interestingly, both in Crimea and in Russia, when Russian citizens are asked about this and asked to defend it, um, many of them, in light of our experience with the, the members of the Russian Duma staff that we met, they were defending this and saying it was adhering to democratic practices and so forth. The Russians on the street said, oh no, it's a complete falsification and lie. I mean, we're totally comfortable that this is propaganda. We're accustomed to that here. But the ends justify the means. We're okay with where this was wound up. And I think, again, the United States is was caught off guard um, they were, we were surprisingly unprepared for this in the West. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so didn't, we haven't, but Rudy often likes to say that we're losing the information war here. We, we haven't been good about um, identifying instances like this and quickly responding and, and recovering. I think the Obama administration has gotten up to speed, so to speak. They're, they're getting better. But when that happened, you're right. I mean, there were really kind of minimal statements from the State Department that came out calling this a, a lie and a farce and all that. Um, but I think now now the game's changed a little bit, and if this was to occur in, in the eastern parts of Ukraine, it, there would be a response from us, at least rhetorically. The other important thing, though, that's different, is, as Rudy pointed out, the composition of those communities is different than Crimea. Um, and I, I do think it's probably safe to say that the majority of Crimean set residents at that moment favored a return to Russia. Whether it was 96% and whether the conditions were fair to vote, uh, I think that's obviously in question. I don't think you'd find the same overwhelming support throughout eastern Ukraine. I think you'd find with lines and, and backgrounds, 
So it, it's not as clean there as it was in, in Crimea. Let's check. Uh, given, say, the ultimate goal of a sovereign country, you know, hoping that it will not be split up, how do you mitigate the idea of um, development from the United States with the idea that, and I mean, you have to battle the propaganda war, which is the Americans have instituted this revolution, or the West is responsible for this revolution, which is somehow that mindset has to be changed and actually take shape, and that the sovereignty of the, of the country could be restored. Um, so I think there are two fronts that have to be operated, and they have to intersect very, okay. very carefully. And, and as I was saying earlier, this is a law. You don't you don't change people's mindset in in a two month, two week period, this is a long term commitment. Um, and to do it, I mean, what do I think fundamentally needs to change is you really do need to improve the system of governance in Ukraine because much of what started, fomented what happened in, in Kiev was as much the dissatisfaction with the move away from the West is, was as much a, a vote against their dissatisfaction with that as it was dissatisfaction with the way things were being run in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine writ large. So Yulia Tymoshenko had been jailed under the Yanukovych regime. And again, we in the West said, oh, that's the good person that's been put in jail. She was released. Wasn't a lot of cheers from people in the streets um, because they saw her as part of a, a, a regime, a system that was not working in favor of, of the people. So to do that is going to be a long haul. And here's where things get really challenging. And here's where we have to be cognizant of the limitations of Western power. So big headline today, IMF provides uh, Ukraine $18 billion bailout. Uh, and so we all think, oh, wow, there's money that's going to cascade over this. Things are going to improve. Well. Part of that is a, a whole series of conditions that Ukraine is going to have to impose that are going to be painful and hurt. Number one, energy use in Ukraine is subsidized. So people pay about 10% of the real cost of energy consumption when you turn on the lights and all of that. Uh, and the IMF has said, if you're going, to, you're going to move, you're going to take this money, you're going to have to adopt a series of changes to the way your economy runs. Uh, which, over the long run, I think will dramatically improve life in Ukraine. And those who are looking for that better way of life uh, will get it. This, to do it is going to hurt um, a lot. Uh, and so we need to be cognizant that it's going to take generations to change the system and, and the mindset. Um, but if we, if we push people into the East versus West battle, we're going to break this place apart. Like, that will happen. Um, and, and we could do that, and things could unfold, in part because I think, I don't think we have a great understanding of what Putin's thinking. I, I don't think we have, have a great understanding of his strategy. We like to sit around and speculate, but we have no idea. We really don't know. Uh, I don't have uh, former President Bush's ability to look into the mind or the eyes and see the soul. I, I don't have that skill. Um, so I, I don't think we know that, which makes this really challenging. Sir, what are your thoughts about the interim prime minister and how he's performing now and whether he will be a factor in the future? I wouldn't want his job. Um, that is not, he does not have an easy task because the, the Ukrainian government, the, the leadership right now is in a bit of a box because they have to, they have to you know, rattle, you know, ring the bells for Ukrainian nationhood. Right? And he's got to play that role up like He's got a signal, we want to stay together. But that will be then the justification for Putin and intermediaries in eastern Ukraine saying, hey, we feel like Russian identity is being um, uh, threatened here because this sounds like nationalism, i.e. fascism will be the, the term of art. Um, so he's got to rally people around the Ukrainian cause, but you've got to do it delicately. He can't be the instigator of, uh, you know, you can't say, let's go send people out to rally in these regions in eastern Ukraine, because that could be the basis for, uh, for someone jumping over uh, into, uh, from, from Russia to say, okay, let's claim these lands. The positive on him that's reported in the news is he's an economist. He understands the economic challenges that, that Ukraine faces moving 
forward. Uh, and the hope of, uh, of Western leaders is that he will be able to, to craft the political arrangements necessary, the agreements between parties, to get Ukraine to move farther down the road towards a more stable economic platform. I don't know his political <coughs> things. I, I think, yeah, he's got a kind of an intellectual understanding of what's required to, to change the system of economic and political government. But talk about trial by fire. I mean, who's going to emerge? And he's now in the thick of a very dynamic and shifting political situation. Um, I, I don't have enough uh, knowledge to be able to say, oh, yeah, he's going to do just fine. Sadly, Rudy, do you need to? Yeah, I've got another presentation. Yeah, he's in demand. Um, so uh, before he leaves, though, if there's any last question for, for Rudy, I'm, I'm happy to stay for another 10 minutes or so. But if there's a I'd, question for Rudy now. I'd like to push you off in a, just a little bit of different direction, Rudy. Um, given that China and Russia have had an uneasy relationship, aren't we in danger as we isolate Russia to try to end up pushing Russia and China together as a force in the world? Don't forget about India. And I, wouldn't, India. I wouldn't use the word danger, but I, I would say that that is happening now. Because of this isolation, Russia is already looking towards Asia for its markets now. So, so it is bringing them together. However, China's in a delicate balancing act, holding on to our debt and having a relationship with us. So you know, China, it's really, China is a big key in all of this because you know, China then let Russia off the hook for energy resources or not, we don't know. Um, they, they mainly look after themselves first and Chinese self-interest. But I don't think it's it's a danger. I think that we're doing what we have to do. But it is causing Russia to look elsewhere for its markets. And where it's looking, China, India, uh, and then other areas in, in Asia. It's, hap it's already happening. So, uh, it's a danger now. Like I said, it's just a reality of what's actually happening. Before you go, sure. would you give us a little historical, sociological rundown of leaders? Putin, what did he have to do with the Ukraine, and what about Khrushchev? Well, that'd, be a, that'd be a long time, but uh, I, would, I would have to summarize that, and, and I would say that, that they are all strong, determined, patriotic leaders who really know how to push their people and push their people's buttons, and really inspire uh, huge things. I mean, if you look back in, in Soviet history, uh, there were huge accomplishments throughout uh, Soviet times and even afterwards. And what's happening right now is Russian patriotic buttons are being pushed. And the, the character of the Russian people is very, very strong. I mean, they endured 444 days of the siege of Leningrad. They, they beat back the Nazis in, in Stalingrad and scorched earth and destroyed all their land so the enemies would get them. So they have a, a character that is now being like reunited or reignited uh, is full of patriotism and love for their country. So I would summarize that all of those leaders, the best of those leaders, are the ones that are really in tune with that Russian character and can push the buttons of the Russian people to think, that, you know what, we can do <coughs> this because we're here for the long haul and we're going to maintain our language, culture, and Russian, strong Russian history. Rudy likes to say that, that Putin is the next czar. Uh, he's in the czarist tradition. But where was Khrushchev in relationship with the Ukraine? Uh, well, well, uh, he loved Ukraine because he actually gifted Crimea to Ukraine. And some people say he was in a drunken stupor or whatever, or a party or something. Who knows? But but he did gift uh, Ukraine to uh, or Crimea to Ukraine. But it wasn't really to Ukraine. It was to the Ukraine uh, SSR, you know, the Soviet Socialist Republic. And there was no thought whatsoever that there would be any consequences. So we're saying, okay, you know, we're gonna we're gonna give uh, Dayton to Ohio. Okay, yeah, so what? Ohio doesn't have break up, so we don't even think about that, right? And then as the world events transpired, so the Union collapsed. Now uh, Crimea was part of Ukraine. There was a whole different issue. But Khrushchev was pro Ukraine and pro that that whole area. He had family from that area. Uh, he loved that area, and the area of Ukraine was very significant in the Soviet uh, world. It was where uh, the, the Missiles and rockets were built. A lot of the best scientists came from you know, Ukraine. Uh, the inventor of helicopters, uh, Igor Sikorsky, came from Ukraine. Uh, so Ukraine, as a region, was always very uh, important to the entire Soviet Union. So the leaders all deferred to, to, to Ukraine. And from an agricultural standpoint, Ukraine was huge. 
consider the breadbasket of all of Europe and the Soviet Union. So, so all of Soviet leaders really deferred and respected the Ukraine. Khrushchev maybe even more, let's say Stalin, who was actually Georgian, a fourth from area of Georgia, or even Br oh, Brezhnev also had a strong affinity, I think even a connection, uh, family connection maybe even from the uh, Ukraine region. Okay, I'm gonna ask for a round of applause for reading. <laughs> Those who at least have initially, there are those who've had their assets frozen. Um, there, there are reports that they wear it as a badge of honor, um, that they, they're sort of the bring it, go ahead, read my assets. Um, I think it's an important, uh, if we are going to go down the sanction road, that's step one. Uh, and you have, to, you have to begin to inflict pain on those who uh, are around Putin uh, with the hope that ultimately their commitment to <coughs> Uh, to, to his leadership will begin to erode as their assets become less valuable. Uh, now, I've read some economic analysis that this actually may benefit Russia over the short run, because what it'll do is it'll cause capital that's been in the West, in banks in Switzerland and the United States, to come back to Russia, so that Russia over the short run will actually get a little bit of a boost because their hard currency reserves will go up. It's, there's, a, there's a high concentration of wealth and very few uh, people. So if, if sanctions are really going to be you know, impactful, you got to expand them and, and you got to go after firms, uh, you got to go after, uh, after industries rather than just the 19 or so people that have initially been, been sanctioned. So go ahead, go ahead Bill. You, uh, this is not an isolated event and it's the beginning of some sea change. Uh, do you think the European members would, European Union members would support the growth of the German military yeah, as the, a counterbalance? Well, that's, that was going to be my response, was that the big debate in Europe now is, I mean, we, the United States for a long time has been saying, we can't be the world's policeman, we can't be the world's policeman, we can't pay for this, we can't keep up our military presence around the world. Um, you all need to step into the vacuum. And I think one of the reasons that the Obama administration um, was kind of caught off guard was they had hoped as they pivoted away from this region, Europe would come in. And for Europe to come in, it means Germany has to come in, right? Germany has both the resources and the military. But this then engages a big debate within Germany about are they, are they far enough past their history in World War II to say we're re ready to take on that, that mantle? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, one scenario is uh, that they say, no, we don't feel the threat that, that this potentially, that we're portraying in the West. We see Russia as a friend. We've been trading with Russia now. We're dependent on them. Um, maybe we'll just be okay with Crimea. As long as it stays there, we won't turn the ignition on. Um, but I think if Putin were to go farther and begin what looks again like the march into Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and that those things come back up, that could that could spark in, um, the Germans to, to say, yeah, it's time for us to take on a role in Europe as, as at least our police. Um, but you're, you're right that this is not, it's not a simple us, you know, the United States and the West versus uh, Russia, it's a very complicated dynamic within. Yeah. I, I just wonder if those European countries would be concerned about German nationalism as much as Russian nationalism. Well, that's probably going to be part of the debate, um, and a lot will be how does Germany conduct itself in its own internal conversation about how this occurs. And I, I will be the first to say I'm not an expert on Germany, um, but your thought about, oh, what's this going to do to Germany, immediately popped into my head as I, as I thought, okay, the United States doesn't have hundreds of thousands of troops in Frankfurt <clears throat> anymore. Um, what are they, they're going to start talking about this. They're going to start worrying a little bit about how, how should we as Germans respond to so, Other question, sir? Going on the Middle East, that we've been working with Russia, how that you get I, again, I'll say I'm not a foreign policy expert. My, my expertise is really in what's going on in Ukraine. But I will say that uh, there, is a, there is a line of thought 
that, that Putin, Rudy loves to say that, that, that Russia plays checker, or chess while we play checkers. Um, and that there's more going on here beyond just this is an opportunity to grab Crimea. Um, that this, this changes the dynamic in the places that, that you just said. Um, and we're weak now. Um, we don't have the ability to, to engage in the kinds of push, push on some of those areas in the same way that we did perhaps before this. And he's Franklin. Uh, and so, again, I'm, I'm now beginning to talk outside of my area of expertise, but I will acknowledge that I think there's more going on here than just Russia's engagement with this particular region. This changes their, their global positioning in a lot of those other conflicts. Let's do one more after this. So, uh, my question actually fits in pretty nicely with Jeff. I was reading in the comments today that only one in five Americans think that this problem matters for us and for our country. Um, obviously, I've been to the guess that we're the ones and not the poor in that area. <laughs> but, um, but what would your, you know, what would the appeal be to them that we can all take uh, back with us about why this is an important issue? Well, my, first, I suppose I would count myself among the four okay. if the argument was that the United States should turn course on its commitment to draw down its military and instead should go the other direction and expand its military in order to combat this. Um, I think there are other reasons we might want to engage a debate about how big or small our military should be, but I don't think this should be the necessarily the reason for us to, in, to, to say, oh, we need to go, go to war over this. I don't think our strategic national interests are in fighting a, a war over this at this moment. But it is most certainly in our strategic national interest to expand economic growth and democracy beyond the boundaries of uh, our own borders and, and Europe. Uh, and so what, what's happening is the, the, the economic system that we are wholly integrated into and our system of governance is being discredited uh, by the incursion of, of Putin into this region and our inability to be able to move things in the way that we would we would like them to. Uh, and <clears throat> Ukraine is so strategically important because it is the boundary between Russia and Europe. Uh, we, we have now expanded the boundaries of Europe uh, to, to this border. Uh, and so if Ukraine were to go towards that side, you, you begin to erode the expansion of, uh, of our system of governance and, and our economic system uh, in an area of strategic national importance. But again, I would not say that we should go to war over this. One last question. I'm sure you heard President Obama say that he would never recognize the annexation of Crimea into Russia, but his voice only carries so much weight in the machine that is the United States government. Do you think at any point we in the international community will recognize the annexation? Um, I don't know. The United Nations just voted today. The majority uh, voted to uh, discredit this, saying they basically did, did not acknowledge it. Um, but that may be meaningless in the sense that uh, we will continue to have diplomatic relations with Ukraine and we will continue to have diplomatic relationships with Russia regardless of whether we acknowledge uh, that they have Crimea uh, or not. Um, you know, I can't predict the future. Is there a day 50 years from now when we'll say that, yes, this is a part of Russia? I don't, I don't know that. But I would imagine over the short term, we will continue to say that this remains. We may not say it remains part of Ukraine, but we won't acknowledge it as part of, uh, as part of Russia. All right, we're at about 7 o'clock. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it.